Willie's Wallabies by Suzanne Keita, illustrated by Lambert Davis. Willie scrambled through the thick undergrowth of the remote island valley, which just happened to be his grandmother's backyard. For years, his ancestors had lived there, far from the crowds. On weekends when his mom had to work, he loved to visit this very special place. He carried with him the critter cage that his grandfather had made for him the summer before he died. Willie usually trapped a little creature to study for a day or two before releasing it. He knew how to respect and care for the critters while they were under his watchful eye. What would he find today? His search took him into the stream below the steep cliffs at the far end of the lush valley. His keen eyes spied a motionless praying mantis, but that was nothing new. Willie decided to hide underneath a bush to watch for whatever might come along. Like the mantis, Willie was perfectly camouflaged and waiting when suddenly what looked like an enormous rabbit leaped boldly into the clearing near his hiding spot. Willie's eyes grew wide and his jaw dropped. He held his breath and froze. He was staring at the strangest creature he had ever seen, and it was nibbling on the leaves of the very bush he was hiding in. Willie knew it wasn't a rabbit, but it hopped like one. What looked like but couldn't be was a miniature kangaroo. Maybe I've been in this magical forest too long, he thought. I'm beginning to see some weird stuff. The munching got closer. Tiny webbed forepaws pulled the leaves apart. Suddenly, they were face to face, shocked, shiny black almond eyes reflecting Willie's wide brown peepers. Both pairs of eyes blinked. Yipes, Willie shrieked, dashing from his shelter and back to the trail. Sweating and panting, he tore through his grand Mother's front gate. Tutu, where are you? He yelled. You never believe what I just saw. His grandmother was resting in her rocking chair on the front porch. Why, Wilfred, Kanahele Kalama, you look like you've seen a ghost, she chuckled. Go get a cool glass of water and a cookie, then come sit down and tell me what this commotion is all about. Willie did it, he was told. He brought water and a cookie for Tutu, too. Okay, Willie boy, tell me what you saw, she said. Willie hesitated, not sure how to begin. Maybe she'll think I'm making up stories again, he thought. Willie was prone to exaggeration, especially with his fish stories. I saw a kangaroo, he whispered. Speak up, child, Tutu said. You know I'm hard of hearing. I saw a wild kangaroo way back there by the cliffs in the valley, Willie blurted. We were eyeball to eyeball, staring at each other. For real, I'm not kidding. You've got to believe me. Tutu smiled, rocked and found herself. A puff of wind rustled through the trees, bringing some relief in the sizzling summer heat. Looks like it might rain this afternoon, Tutu said, looking at the clouds clumping on the mountain tops like cotton candy. Okay, Willie, you're not crazy. I was wondering how long it would take you to find out about our special friends. But before I go any further, I want you to promise me something. If I tell you what I know, you will swear to keep this a secret. Cross your heart? Willie crossed his heart. I swear, Tutu, I'll never tell anyone. You know that my family has lived here almost forever, she said. We were always grateful for this valley filled with fruit and fresh water. In return, we have loved and taken care of this land, which has given us so much. For many years, we have lived good and happy lives with no surprises. But you got one today, didn't you? Her eyes gleamed. You know what you saw today? A wallaby. Wallaby? Full-grown wallaby. Willie scrunched his face and stood firm. No, Tutu, I saw a baby kangaroo, he insisted. A wallaby looks just like a little kangaroo, Grandma said. And there are plenty of them hiding in those cliffs, maybe a hundred or more. I've seen their tiny heads on the cute, on their cute, saggy-shouldered, pear-shaped bodies. They look so bottom-heavy with their wee heads hanging high over their huge hind feet, followed by their long, fuzzy tails. Willie thought his tutu was telling a tall tale. But the more she talked, the more he believed her or wanted to. Willie boy, I'm not just talking stories, she said. Back in 1916, some folks near town started their own private zoo, including a wallaby family imported from Australia. One day, dogs broke into the wallaby's cage and killed their baby, called a joey, but the parents escaped into the hills and survived. What you saw today was the offspring of these immigrants many generations later. They found protection in the cliff caves of our valley. You were lucky to see one because they usually only roam between dark and dawn. Willie could hardly believe it. If this was true, why doesn't anyone know about them? He asked. Everyone would want to come and see them. And he stopped short when he saw Tutu's expression. Her eyes were sad and serious. Hold on. Don't you see where this could go? Folks would try to catch them and cage them, or they'd hunt them down with dogs or use them for target practice. Those poor little fellows wouldn't stand a chance. There are only a few outsiders who know of our secrets, she continued. For about 10 years, we've allowed certain scientists to come and study this mob. That's 
what they call a kangaroo group, a mob, she chuckled. These researchers have promised not to hurt our friends and have sworn not to reveal the colony's location. We must do all we can to help protect these dear creatures who have adapted to our island home. Any questions? Willie had just one. Can I go back now? I forgot my bug box. Tutu nodded. Just remember, these wallabies share our valley home, so take care. Why don't you take a snack? Then you can watch them until the sun sets. Willie hugged and kissed his grandmother. Thanks, Tutu. You're the best. He ran inside, grabbed some bananas, and raced out the screen door. See you later. Wish me luck, he yelled as he disappeared into the forest. In no time, Willie was back as his stakeout. His critter cage was occupied by a curious chameleon. So Willie latched the door. This is my lucky day, he thought. He saw many things that afternoon, but he didn't see another wallaby. Disappointed, he let the chameleon go before heading back at twilight. It was like a dream, he thought. Maybe I'll never see another wallaby again. But that night, he dreamed of wallabies. He watched them climb around on rocks by their caves. They played and wrestled in the moonlight. Just like full-sized kangaroos, the next morning, Willie asked his tutu if Uncle Cats could go with him to see the wallabies that night. Grandmother wasn't surprised that Willie had a new game plan. Since he had struck out the previous afternoon, well, he knows them mighty well. Maybe he'd like to share with you, eh? Grandma teased. I'll ask him since tomorrow's a holiday. He might not mind. That night, as they finished a hearty supper of fish, lalo, and poi, Uncle Cat said, Lucky there's a full moon tonight, Willie. Want to see some wallabies? The moon should like a spotlight on the tall cliffs across the silvery stream. The spectators quietly settled among the how trees, spying on the eerie blue-white scene unseen. Slowly, the tattooed cliffs came to life. Dark heads peeked out of the shadows as wallabies oozed out of every nook and crevice, creeping like spiders across the ledges to visit each other's caves, scooting around as if they had magnets on their feet. Jumping gracefully, twelve feet across the open spaces, they landed squarely on their padded hind feet, using their tails as balancing poles. What awesome athletes, Willie thought. What a great show. Because their forelegs and hind legs were quite different lengths, the wallabies looked awkward as they grazed on the thick grass beside the stream. Unaware of their audience, several do doos, does carried youngsters in their pouches. One bent down low to nibble on the tender grass shoots, and her joey did the same from its perch. That's a new kind of drive through fast food, Willie thought, grinning silently. A few joeys crawled out to eat on their own, but they didn't wander far from the adults. Startled, one youngster dove headfirst for the safety of its mother's sap, then squirmed until her feet disappeared. Soon her eyes peeked out of the cozy pocket that she called home sweet home. What a life, Willie thought, laughing to himself. They live in a fairy tale world. It's too bad no one else knows they're here. Ooh, a whale or a white owl blessed the magical scene, casting its shadow without threatening the revelers below. Willie respected this spirit creature, an almakua that many Hawaiians hold sacred. It was just after midnight. And Uncle Cat's motion that they better head for home. Sneaking away, Willie wondered which of these wonderful wallabies had been the one munching leaves just inches from his nose the day before. When they got back to the house, Uncle Cat told Willie everything he knew about wallabies and answered his never-ending questions. Finally, Willie dozed off to an enchanted garden where friendly wallabies and humans played all their dreams together. The next day, Tutu gave Willie permission to tell his mom about his wallaby, wallaby weekend, but she reminded him that he was not to share the secret with anyone else. Willie was about to burst. Wallaby words were screaming to get out. Could he hold true to his promise? He wanted more than anything to tell his friends every detail of his unbelievable adventure, but he didn't. Before summer's end, Willie got to spend one whole week in the valley watching wallabies. No rain had fallen for weeks, so the singing stream was nearly dry. The wallabies couldn't feed close to their home, so they had to fan out and search for moist leaves and fruit deeper in the forest. This made mob watching easier for Willie, who trailed them as they wandered here, there, and everywhere. He would often lay out fresh guavas and lily koi for the wallabies to find and eat. Their pot bellies swelled like holding tanks, stretching to contain the bonds of food they eat daily to stay alive. Willie noticed that just like cattle, they could chew cud when there was not enough food to be found. Sometimes after feeding, they relaxed and lazed around in a cool, shady spot. On very hot days to keep from overheating, they licked their forearms, allowing the evaporating moisture to cool their bodies. Often they groomed themselves and each other, combing through fur and plucking off pesky insects. Willie observed that one toe of each hind foot had two sharp claws that could be used like tweezers or weapons if necessary. He loved to watch them play, poking and pulling at each other's ears and tails. Or they do acrobatics, jumping around like giant grasshoppers and ricocheting off each other, the shrubs and the rocks. Young and old alike loved to wrestle. Some two, Sometimes two males would box. First they circled each other, standing tall and throwing out their chests, trying to look as large as possible. Next, the rivals closed in, chins high, clicking and grunting 
while using their front paws to throw each other off balance like sumo wrestlers. When they got really serious, they leaned back on their tails for support, then let their hind feet fly, kicking and clawing at each other's bellies. The loser always walked away from these bouts with head hanging, but no harm done. The winner left with his pride and maybe a new mate. Willie got to know many of the wallabies well. One doe kept nudging her joey to come out of her pouch. It was fun to see the youngster finally take his first wobbly steps. After a few licks of encouragement, his mother helped him climb back inside. Every day the joey got braver and braver. So did Willie. By the end of the week, he was wondering if it wasn't time to start spreading the news. When he told Tutu, she sent him packing. It's time for you to keep your mouth shut, boy. You go back to school and study hard about wallabies and everything else. And if you keep your promise and guard our secret, I'll let you come back in October to study the wallabies with our scientist friend, she said firmly. For the next two months, everyone was amazed at how much energy Willie put into his schoolwork. His grades were outstanding. He spent 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 lots of time researching wallabies and other roos, as the Australians call their kangaroo cousins. He found out that they both belong to a large family of mammals called marsupials, numbering about 260 species. These interesting animals give birth to tiny helpless offspring that attach themselves to the mother's nipple for feeding inside her pouch where they stay for several months until they can explore the world on their own. Some of Willie's friends noticed that his new focus and started teasing him about being a, about being a wallaby wa- wannabe. Meanwhile, Willie's imagination was getting the best of him. When he closed his eyes, he saw a picture of Willie's wallaby world, the most popular tourist tra- attraction on the island. Hidden fences enclosed the giant circus so it didn't seem like a zoo. Bleachers built along the stream held the throngs who paid to watch the wallaby acts and sideshows. One ring was for the acrobats, another was for the boxers, another for the wrestlers, and another for the groomers. Over on one side would be the petting and feeding zoo, and a place where you could have your picture taken with a real live wallaby. The cliff caves were lit with floodlights so that folks could enjoy the spectacular show day and night. Willie and his family would become rich and famous, and hold on, not yet, Willie kept telling himself. First First I got to meet the zoologist. Maybe she can teach me something I don't know, but I doubt it. I think I know just about everything there is to know about wallabies and what to do with them next. Late one October, Dr. Merle arrived with lab kits, traps, and tags. She agreed to let Willie and Uncle Katz go with her, grateful for the chance to continue the wallaby studies in their valley. Before setting out, the doctor shared her expertise with Willie, explaining how Hawaiian wallabies are different from their Australian brush-tailed rock wallaby relatives. First, the Hawaiian variety are smaller and lighter, and standing about knee high and weighing between 8 and 13 pounds. Their skull shape is also different. Their ears are larger and their fur is light, lighter gray. Hawaiian males and females are about the same size, while the bucks down under are larger than the does, and local wallabies mature more slowly than their Australian kin. Willie was impressed with Dr. Mer- Merrill's comparisons and decided that he might be able to learn a thing or two after all. That night... The intrepid trio set wire cages baited with fresh fruit throughout the Wallaby Valley. After a restless night's sleep, the team checked on the traps with wonderful results. They had caught 10 specimens. First, each Wallaby was transferred into a burlap bag. Then the critter was nudged and prodded until only its head emerged. A numbered yellow tag was attached to the corner of one ear and a blood sample was drawn. Then each animal was weighed, measured, and released. Most of the captives were pretty cooperative, but several tried to bite and scratch their handlers. Willie was relieved when he saw each of his friends scamper off unhurt after the ordeal, wearing a new yellow earring to identify it in future studies. That night after supper, Willie quizzed the wildlife expert. Will these wallabies eat up all the plants in our valley? He asked Dr. Mara. He had read that Australian wallabies and roos are considered pests by farmers and ranchers. Dr. Mara assured him that the Hawaiian wallabies wouldn't harm the abundant local vegetation. Do our state wildlife officers know you're doing this study? Willie asked next. Of course, they're the ones who invited me here, she said. I studied endangered species all over the world. Do you know how special your wallabies are and why this is such a fascinating project? We may be witnessing evolution in action. Willie was all ears, as Dr. Merrill explained. We now have three possible theories on your local wallabies. Since they are not exactly like the Australian species, One is that they were descendants of a now extinct population of Australian rock wallabies, or maybe the original family brought over for their private zoo were not typical and had strange, unusual offspring. But the most exciting theory is that a new form of wallaby has been adapting to your climate and evolving right before our eyes during these past 80 years. 
Wow, Willie gasped. This is, a, this is a big deal. It's also a very important secret, Willie, Dr. Merrill continued. The state of Hawaii has declared these wallabies an endangered and protective species. It's against the law to hunt or threaten them in any way. We could be nurturing the birth of a new species, and that is so exciting at a time when too many animals, birds, and plants are disappearing from the face of our earth because of human carelessness and greed. That night, Willie's versions of Willie's wallaby world had vanished into thin air now. How could he have ever imagined turning his quiet valley paradise into a theme park? How could he have considered exposing the fragile, frightened newcomers to such a cruel fate? What was I thinking? He muttered angrily to himself. The next day, Dr. Mara had to leave their valley to work on another project. She was proud when Willie asked what he could do to protect the wallabies. Just keep their secret, Willie, she said. It's for their good and the good of the earth. Everything is connected. If one living thing disappears, we all lose. Remember, we have to protect those who can't protect themselves, Uncle Cat Katz added. The wallabies are a special gift, and it's our job to care for them. Tutu hugged Willie. Our state model says it well, she reminded him. O mau keea o ka'aina i kapono. Tell Dr. Mara what it means, Willie. Willie stood tall. The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness, he recited proudly. To this day, wild wallabies live peacefully and flourish in Willie's hidden valley. The end.